all ribosomes start off as free floating ribosomes in the cytoplasm, and some ribosomes become bound to the rough endoplasmic reticulum during translation. It's the final destination of the protein itself that decides where it needs to go, um, either to stay in the cytosol or to complete the rest of translation into the lumen of the rough ER. Free ribosomes typically make proteins that are going to do a job inside that cell. There are exceptions to this that I'll talk about in a bit, but typically they will do protein jobs inside the cell. They might need to stay in the cytoplasm, for example, and perform a function, or they may need to get incorporated into mitochondria or chloroplasts to perform their function. Bound ribosomes are different. They have to be brought to the rough ER, and then uh, the rest of protein synthesis will be made into the lumen of the rough ER. You can see a picture of that here. The protein is being made into the lumen of the rough ER. Typically, these proteins need to be made this way because they are gonna go through the process of modification in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Then they will be sent to the Golgi where they will be finished up if they needed to, and then packaged in a vesicle. Once they're packaged in a vesicle, that vesicle will take them to their final destination. So free ribosomes don't need to go through modification or packaging in the uh, rough ER or Golgi apparatus, um, but bound ribosomes do have to go through that process. So examples of when they may need to go through that process is if they are going to be incorporated into a membrane. So if they are gonna be incorporated into the membrane of an organelle, um, like the ER or the Golgi, or the plasma membrane, which is shown in, oops, sorry, going back. Which is, going back. Which is shown in this picture down here. You can see that um, here's the rough ER. The protein is going to get made in the rough ER, modified in the rough ER from a bound ribosome. Then it's going to leave the rough ER, go into the Golgi, where it will be finished up, and then it will be repackaged in a vesicle. That vesicle is made up of phospholipid bilayer. It's going to carry that uh, membrane protein to the plasma membrane, where it fuses with the membrane and can incorporate that protein into the actual membrane itself. So for example, if it's going to be a channel protein or a pump or um, a receptor protein in the membrane, so it would have to go through that process. Proteins that are going to be secreted from the cell itself to do a job outside the cell would also go through this process. The difference is instead of incorporating the protein into the membrane, the protein would get released outside of the cell. And then proteins that are going to get incorporated into lysosomes, um, like digestive enzymes that are going to be used to help hydrolyze uh, unwanted materials and clean up the cell, they will also go through this process because a lysosome is a packaged um, membrane-bound organelle. And so it would go through this process, uh, get packaged, but then it would just stay in the cell um, as a lysosome with a bunch of enzymes inside of it. Polysomes is a term that refers to many ribosomes working on the same uh, mRNA strand, translating multiple copies of the same protein sequence at the same time. This increases the efficiency of protein synthesis because now we're not only making one copy of that protein along an mRNA strand, but we're making lots of copies of the same protein all at the same time. There are gonna be differences in polysomes in prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. The slide focuses on prokaryotes. Remember that transcription and translation is coupled in prokaryotes, meaning they do it simultaneously. While mRNA is being made, uh, translation is already occurring. But in addition to that, translation is occurring using polyribosomes. So you can see many ribosomes are all translating the same mRNA strand at the same time. So we'll be making lots of copies. And all of that is happening while transcription is also occurring. So anytime you see a diagram that has the DNA and polysomes, you know it has to be in a prokaryote because it's not possible to have 
ribosomes working on mRNA while working on the DNA in eukaryotes, um, aka the AP terminology for polysomes is polyribosomes. So it's very similar. Um, the concept is the same, but the term is a little different. Uh, it's one of the few vocabulary differences between IB and AP. IB will call it a polysome. This shows you um, the same concept, right? So here's the mRNA strand, here's the incoming ribosome. So you can see these ones are farther along because they're moving down in the five prime to three prime direction, reading the mRNA and building the protein. And then here shows that they have dissociated because the process is done. So now they could come in again and translate more copies if we wanted to. Notice you don't see the DNA strand in this one. You just see mRNA, uh, protein chain, and ribosome. So potentially this could be in a eukaryote um, because we can't see the DNA. So again, polysomes do occur in eukaryotes as well. They just cannot occur at the same time as transcription is occurring. So here's a good diagram showing the differences. Proteins are going to fold up and take on multiple structures. Uh, the first level is called primary sequence of amino acids. This is just a straight chain of amino acids. Uh, no folding has occurred yet. So DNA contains the instructions for this to put the amino acids in the right order into a chain. Secondary structures are always very organized. Um, they will involve hydrogen bonding between carboxyl and amino groups of amino acids that are fairly near each other, and they will always form organized patterns, such as an alpha helix, you can see the hydrogen bonds here, or the beta pleated sheet, which is more of like an accordion style um, protein structure. But notice they are very organized patterns. Also, please note that there are no R groups that are interacting at this level. It's all between the carboxyl and amino groups. Tertiary structures is when the R groups do become important. This is when they interact to further fold the protein up. This is when they will take on a very three-dimensional shape. Many proteins fully function at this level and don't go on to the fourth level. There are different kinds of interactions that can occur to fold up the tertiary structure between the R groups. Remember, there's 20 different R groups, so we would expect for them to all react differently um, and behave a certain way in the presence of water because some of them will be charged and others will not. So they can form hydrogen bonds. They can form ionic bonds. They can form disulfide uh, covalent bonds. These are called disulfide bridges and hydrophobic interactions between two hydrophobic amino acids. An example of disulfide bridges is shown here. It's typically between the cysteine amino acids because in the R groups of cysteine, there is sulfur. And so having two cysteines near each other means that they can form this covalent bond between their sulfur atoms. And again, that's called a disulfide bridge because there's two sulfur atoms involved. Um, another example is on the carboxyl and amino groups in R groups, so not on one amino acid itself, but in an actual R group. Um, the carboxyl and amino groups can become dissociated, um, which means again lose a hydrogen and gain a negative charge because of that, or they could gain hydrogen atoms, in which case they would form a positive charge. Either way, the R groups can form charge. If the R groups have charge, they would be able to form ionic bonds. Uh, the fourth level is called quaternary level. A quaternary protein includes multiple polypeptide chains coming together and functioning as one functioning protein. A great example of this is he hemoglobin. So you can see down here, it is showing hemoglobin. We talked about this a lot in BioH. Hemoglobin is a quaternary molecule because it has four tertiary structures that come together, the two blue ones and the two green ones. Quaternary proteins may also become what's called conjugated proteins. Um, conjugated proteins have an extra part on them that allows for them to enhance their function. That extra part is something that's not made of amino acids. It has to be made of something else. For example, hemoglobin right here, has these heme groups. You can see the heme groups in it. Those heme groups are called a prosthetic part. So they're not actually part of the 
protein chain itself. They're not made up of amino acids. Um, they're something extra that enhances the function. So he, the heme group has iron, which allows for the binding of oxygen. And so it allows for hemoglobin to bind more oxygen because of the presence of the heme group. So again, because it has that prosthetic group, um, it would be considered a conjugated protein. In BioH, I typically give the example of thinking about um, the prosthetic group as like something that's not part of that particular structure, but helps them function better like a prosthetic limb. Like if someone loses part of their leg, they can get a prosthetic limb and that will help them um, function better, right? They can, it will help them do more normal activities easier, like walking and even running sometimes. But a prosthetic leg is not actually part of them. It's not a human part. It's something different that's been added to them to help them. So same concept with the prosthetic group here. And again, here just shows the different um, folds, how straight chains lead to secondary structures, which lead to tertiary structures, which may lead to quaternary structures. We talked earlier about post-transcriptional modifications. This slide is about post-translational modifications. So after translation has occurred, there may be modifications that will allow for the protein to become more functional. So sometimes we have to remove methionine from the 5' end to allow for the protein to function. Remember, methionine serves as the start codon, um, or the AUG serves as the start codon, so methionine does start every chain. So it is important, but it's all, not always needed for the function of the overall molecule. Um, we may have to add modifications to the R group. So this may involve adding phosphate groups, which is called phosphorylation, or we may have to add other things to it, like carbohydrates um, or other types of chemicals. We may have to fold it. So we just talked about that extensively on the last slide. Um, intramolecular interactions would specifically refer to interactions that are occurring within one polypeptide chain, so within one molecule. So that would be secondary structures um, using their hydrogen bonds and within tertiary structures um, using those different types of bonds, like the di disulfide bridges or ionic bonds. Um, we may have to convert propeptides, which are inactive proteins, to mature or active proteins by removing part of the polypeptide chain. So that is sometimes possible. In IB year two, Ms. Lockwood will go over more specific examples um, of that bullet point. So I might add like I, IB year two next to this one because she will come back to it. Um, you can combine more than two polypeptides or two or more polypeptide chains to make a quaternary structure. That's also a modification. And then you may have to add different non um, protein parts to it to create a conjugated protein. And so I just gave that example of the prosthetic heme group and hemoglobin. So these are all post-translational modifications that will help the protein become functional or more functional. Eventually, we've used the protein enough. Um, we don't need it anymore. You don't need that protein to continue to build up inside the cell. And so we would need a way to get rid of proteins that are no longer needed. So this is going to be done by a molecule called a proteasome, and it's going to break down that protein into amino acids, which is called proteolysis. Remember, lysis means to break. Proteo means protein. So proteasomes are molecules that break down um, proteins into amino acids, and this will use ATP in order to get this done. This is important because when you're done with these proteins and we break them down, it will recycle the amino acids, which means you now have amino acids that your cells can use to build more proteins. You do also get amino acids from your diet and your cells can actually synthesize some amino acids too, but recycling them is a good way to keep the resources available inside the cell. So it's not quite as dependent on diet and things like that. Proteasomes don't only break down proteins that we're finished with. They also would break down proteins that are 
damaged, like they're not working correctly or they've been misfolded so they're not functioning well, um, they would break those down as well. How they break them down is by um, the protein that needs to go to the proteasome is going to get tagged with a chain of ubiquitins. Ubiquitin is a little protein chain and we're going to add a bunch of these little protein chains um, to the protein that is going to be broken down and this will mark the protein for degradation. Now the protein can go into the proteasome um, and get broken down into amino acids. So there's a really simple picture down here showing that. Here's our protein that we want to get rid of. Here's ubiquitin, which is a small protein chain. So it's not just like one amino acid. Ubiquitin is not an amino acid. It is a small protein chain. And so we're going to add several of these ubiquitins. Once we've added all the ubiquitins, they go to the proteasome, and then they get broken down into amino acids. Um, this is technically a post trans relational modification as well because we are modifying the protein right we're adding the ubiquitin to it the difference is and the reason i didn't add this on the last slide is because the last slide specifically said um, that those were post-translational modifications that would add to the function of that protein this isn't adding to the function it's leading to the degradation of this protein so it won't be functional anymore after this but it is still a post-translational modification. Not all parts of DNA code for proteins, but that does not mean that they're not important. We have focused a lot on genes coding for mRNA, which code for proteins, but there are plenty of other parts of the DNA strand itself um, that don't actually code for a protein, um, but they still may have important functions. So a bunch are gonna be listed up here. The genes that code for RNAs that are not mRNAs. So for example, we still have to use DNA's code um, to transcribe it into tRNA, for example, or to transcribe it into rRNA or sNRNA, small nuclear RNA. And there's many other types of RNAs as well that we don't cover. So creating those particular mRNAs, they do come from DNA's code. DNA contains the code to make all the RNAs that are out there, um, but those types of RNAs don't get translated into actual proteins. They have other functions that they're going to do, right? Like bring amino acids to the ribosome, um, help form peptide bonds if you're rRNA acting like a ribozyme, uh, helping in the splicing process if you are sNRNA. They have other jobs to do. Telomeres are going to be the repetitive sequences that are found at the ends of eukaryotic chromosomes. We learned about this in BioH. They just repeat the same sequence over and over and over again. And they are important because it prevents the fusing of the two ends of the chromosome together. That way they stay linear. And then in addition to this, they also help in the erosion process, which is when your DNA strands get shorter and shorter and shorter with each round of DNA replication. Remember, you lose a little bit of um, DNA every time DNA replicates. The daughter strands get a little bit shorter, and that's okay because the telomeres are on the end. So we're just losing some of that telomere, and that doesn't matter because the telomere is non-coding, so we're not losing any coding sequences. The promoter, we already talked about the promoter um, as an example of um, a part of the DNA molecule that acts as like a highlighter for RNA polymerase to bind to. And remember, the promoter itself will not be transcribed. Transcription starts a little ways downstream from the promoter at the initiation site. Introns, they are found between exons, and exons are the coding sequences of the gene. Introns are found in the genes, but they're not coding, um, so they won't actually be translated into proteins. They do have some functions. Scientists think that they are important in increasing the chances of crossing over um, on the chromosomes, amongst other things. And then enhancers and silencers, these are going to be regions on the DNA strand um, that are typically found upstream from the promoter that uh, will either help to speed up the rate of transcription or slow down the rate of transcription. So when we talk about the gene regulation notes, which is the next set of notes, I will come back to enhancers and silencers. But for now, you do need to know that they are an example of a part of DNA that does not code for a protein.
and that's it for these notes.